Chapter 5 The next morning the young folks gathered at Broad Acres. All the school children were there except Albert Smith and Dick Osborne, and Dick, poor boy, was toiling sullenly and alone in the garden at home. The young war gardeners became so interested in the task they had set themselves that they returned to it in the afternoon, and their black mayo found them when he came to bring Mrs. Wilson some tomato plants. What is this Agnes? A chatterbox club? He inquired, setting a basket carefully in a shaded place. From the noise I heard at a distance, I thought crows or blue jays might be holding a caucus in your garden. The young folks were duly indignant at the slander, and asserted that their hands most of them, anyway, and well, most of the time were going as fast as their tongues. Come and see what we are doing invited Patsy. Here are our potatoes. We are giving half of our garden to them. Isn't the soil fine? And aren't the rows pretty and even? Cousin Agnes showed us how to lay them off by a string tied to sticks at the ends of the row. I wish the potatoes would hurry and come up said sweet William so I can get the bugs off them. Hey, old scout, said Black Mayo. Are you in it too? course I am was the complacent answer. I was the first to join. Wasn't I? Cousin Agnes. I reckon I've walked 10 miles well. I know I've walked a mile today, carrying buckets of potatoes to the children to plant. Didn't I? Cousin Agnes? You've been helping, dear. We couldn't get on without you. Nothing in the village could get on without our sweet William said Mrs. Wilson, kissing him. He accepted the caress soberly, and then said with a little frown, I reckon I'm most too big for ladies to kiss. Ah, Billy boy, you'll change your mind in a few years, laughed Black Mayo. What's that bag of bonacy thing at your heels? He's my dog, he's Scalawag the youngster explained with dignity. A dog, eh? A poor excuse for a dog. Where'd you get it? I didn't get him. He came and adopted me, explained sweet William. He's a mighty good dog. See, he's watching me like he wants to help. Cousin Mayo, look at the bean rows I am laying off called Patsy. Really and truly, Cousin Mayo said Anne, don't you think it's good for us to have a garden? Truly and really, my dear, he said, I think it's splendid. You are helping and how much the willing, diligent children all over the land can help. In America's work of saving the world from starving, the fighters can't farm. So we must feed the armies, and we have the people of France and Belgium on our hearts and hands, and there are the U-boats we must have food enough to send another shipload for every one they sink. It's a big job. We gardeners will do our part. I'm going to help when I come back in June said Anne. She's helping while she's away. Cousin Mayo said Patsy. She suggested our having a garden. And her happy acres, all except the flower part, is to be put in corn. Our canning club is going to can corn and butter beans and tomatoes together to make Brunswick stew. Cousin Agnes says we can surely sell all we put up. The girls think pie of their old canning club, said David, jealously. We boys are doing real work in our corn club, and we are going to have a real garden not dawdle around like a parcel of girls come come chided mr osborne you are working for the same cause you are in friendly camps not hostile ones by the way what are their names names they haven't any said patsy saw they must have names of course they must camp feed friend isn't that a good name for yours patsy and the boys plot can be camp fight foe all right said david then he laughed maybe the girls will raise enough to feed friend hummingbird here my boy said mr osborne it isn't a sign of wisdom or experience to be scornful of girls and women you may do better work than the girls and then again you may not. Time will prove. Suppose you keep a record of your work and have a competitive exhibition of garden products this autumn. I'll give a prize, the silver cup I cut my teeth on, to the best gardeners. Fine, said Steve. That cup is as good as ours. There's many a slip twixt cup, and lit Patsy reminded him, with a saucy tilt of her chin. Mr. Osborne laughed. Well, while I loaf here, my work's getting no forwarder. I must go home. By the way, Agnes, I have two or three bushels of potatoes for you that I'll send, but... Mayo, you can't spare neither could you, he said, looking at the war garden rose. 
goodbye. Oh, I was forgetting the pigeon I brought Dick. He picked up his basket. Poor hungry bird. Hungry. Let me feed it, said Mrs. Wilson. Here are a few peas left in my seed box. Oh, no. No, thank you, he answered. It is a racing pigeon that I'm beginning to train. It must start off hungry, so it will fly home to be fed. Let me see it. Cousin Mayo, please let me take it in my hands, said Anne. She cuddled the dove against her cheek. What a pretty, gentle bird it is. The emblem of peace, isn't it? Oh, what a shame it seems to send it from this quiet, sweet place to those terrible battlefields. Mr. Osborne put one caressing hand on the bird and the other on Anne's head. These God's dear creatures bear messages of help and rescue through the battle cloud. They soar above and beyond it, and their wings catch the eternal sunshine. Ah, our doves of war are still are more than ever the birds of peace. For this war isn't just a fight for territory and undisturbed sea ways. It is a war for freedom and human rights, and so for true and lasting peace. Agnes he turned to Mrs. Wilson. Have you given our young folks the president's message? Not yet, she answered. Not yet, he repeated reproachfully. And already it is being read in French schools. It is a part of the history of our times. Of all time, it's like the Declaration of Independence, but wider, higher, grander. I'm going to read it to my history class, said Mrs. Wilson. To every one of these young folks, from primer babies up, and now Black Mayo said impetuously, Get the paper. Let's sit in the summer house here and fancy it's the capital. And this is the history-making night of April 2D. Here we are, waiting for the president. He's coming. The throngs on the streets are cheering him at every step. The floor of the house is crowded its own members. Senators, cabinet officers, judges of the Supreme Court, representatives of the allied nations. The galleries, too, are crowded. People waited at the doors for hours for the precious privilege of a seat. The president rises, solemn and resolute with a great duty. He stands there before the house, before the world for all time. He is America speaking. He gives the message that devotes a hundred million people to war for American rights and world freedom. It is done. He turns to go. And now, ah, now statesmen are not Democrats, not Republicans. They are only patriots. Men who have stood with the president. Men who have stood against him, throng shoulder to shoulder to clasp his hand, and pledge themselves to support him in the sacred cause. Only the little group of willful men stands shamefully apart. Here are the words that expressed and inspired the soul of America. And then Mayo Osborne read the president's war message. The wrongs against which we now array ourselves are no common wrongs. They cut to the very roots of human life. We are at the beginning of an age in which it will be insisted that the same standards of conduct and of responsibility for wrong done shall be observed among nations and their governments that are observed among the individual citizens of civilized states. The world must be made safe for democracy. Its peace must be planted upon the tested foundations of political liberty. We have no selfish ends to serve. We desire no conquests, no dominion. We seek no indemnities for ourselves, no material compensation for the sacrifices we shall freely make. The right is more precious than peace, and we shall fight for the things which we have always carried nearest our hearts for democracy, for the right of those who submit to authority to have a voice in their own governments, for the rights and liberties of small nations, for a universal dominion of right by such a concert of free people, as shall bring peace and safety to all nations, and make the world itself at last free. To such a task we can dedicate our lives and our fortunes, everything that we are and everything that we have with the pride of those who know that the day has come when america is privileged to spend her blood and her might for the principles that gave her birth and happiness and the peace which she has treasured god helping her she can do no other there was a minute of silence at the end with ice shining through tears mrs wilson turned to her daughter oh Ruth, Ruth. She said, if only you were a boy in khaki, and I at your side. Oh, mother. 
I WW wish I were, cried Ruth. It's wonderful. Black Mayo tapped the paper with a thoughtful finger. He Americanizes the war, and does it by putting aside everything for which the land of dollars is supposed to stand, and upholding our old high ideals. No indemnity. No conquests. The Lusitania was an insult to our flag, more than that. It was a dishonor to humanity. He starts us on a high-going road, said Mrs. Wilson. Please broke in David. Let's finish planting our corn before dark. Righto, boy, exclaimed Black Mayo, jumping up, and my plow's standing still. Gemini, how time flies. He hurried away and the war gardeners went back to work. Will you look who's coming? Patsy exclaimed presently, glancing toward the gate. Jeff Spencer and Will Epps. Mrs. Wilson hastened to meet the visitors who had been her pupils from ABC days till they went to university and engineering corps. Why, Jeff, I didn't know you were at home, she said, shaking hands with the boy in front, a pleasant-looking, round-faced fellow, so fat that he resembled a well-stuffed pincushion. I, I am not at the university any longer, Miss Agnes, he said soberly. Not at the university. She looked at him in dismay. He had always been a mischievous chap, and she had had her doubts and fears about his college course. But gradually these had subsided. Now he was in his senior year, and here he was back home. What scrape had he got into? Jeff's light blue eyes were twinkling, and now he laughed till his fair, freckled face reddened to the roots of his sandy hair. I always could get a rise out of you, Miss Agnes, he said. Here you are wondering what I've done to get sent away from the university, just as mother did. And it never occurred to you that I've left of my own free will. A new light came into the bright eyes. I've enlisted. And, gee, won't a uniform be full of me? Enlisted, she echoed. But, Jeff, your mother she always said she could never consent to, oh, she's a Trump, the ace of trumps. Of course she hates war. The war took so many of her people her father and both her uncles and all the things. She knows what war is. But when I put it up to her, she said go. Of course I'd have had to do it anyway. I couldn't look myself in the face in a mirror if I sat safe at home and let others risk their lives to make the world a decent place for me to live in. So I've come to say goodbye to you. Who he returned to his waggish tone put me up to going. I she was amazed. Why, Jeff, I've not seen you even to say how'd I do, since war was declared. Oh, I wasn't thinking about lately. It was the way you taught us history, not Jack's book that was so dry every time we turned a page it raised dust, but in spite of it, you made us know what America stands for. The things for which a man ought to be willing and glad to risk his life. Grandmother says he grinned, I'm fighting for Confederate principles, the right of self-government. Isn't she a darling, red-hot old Southerner? And I'm going to, Cousin Agnes said William Epps. I didn't know it till yesterday, but father knew it. Your father knew it, she repeated. Yes, he'd been might quiet lately, and at last he came out with. There never had been an American war without an Epps in it, and here are the two of us, and I can take my choice, but he hoped I'd stay at home and let him go, being a Spanish-American vet. I asked him if he knew what a whopper he was telling, why, he'd have dropped in his tracks if I had showed the white feather, and said I wasn't willing to go, but I just hadn't thought of it. It didn't take me two secs to decide, of course I'm going, and so you boys are joining the army, going to France to fight. It seemed but yesterday since they were little fellows in her primer class. And now they were going, with the bodies and hearts of men, to do men's work in the world. Through the mist in her eyes she had a vision. New pages of the history book opened. Heroes walked out, took form and life, lo. They were her own schoolboys shy Fayette Mallet, mischievous Jeff Spencer, slow William Epps and others, others would come. Why, here were the youngsters, even little sweet William putting a side play to do their part. Oh, goody, goody. Sweet William was saying now, in his high, eager little voice, we've got soldiers, our own soldiers, to send things to. Come on, Jeff, you and Will. 
Look at our gardens. And then half a dozen talking at once, explained about camp fight foe and camp feed friend. I'm surely glad to see these gardens, said Jeff. I always was a hearty eater, and my stomach for fighting needs to be a full one. We're going to claim the best food we see over there, aren't we, Bill? Biggest potatoes and sweetest beans, for I know they'll come from the village straight to us. We'll think of you when the weather gets warm, and we'll work hard and not loaf on the job, said Alice Blair. Thank you, said William. It seems a shame for you to tan your face and blister your hands for us. I like to do it for you, said Alice. And then she blushed. I should think you'd be going to Fort Myer, Jeff said David. Well, I did think about the OTC, answered Jeff but I felt sorry for those poor officers. It seemed to me they need a few privates under them, so I decided to be in the ranks. And I'm going to try to get with Northern boys. Jeff Spencer, why? So I can do missionary work, he explained. Those Harvard chaps I met on our last game bully fellows they were, thought the old United States began in 1620 on Plymouth Rock. I broke to him the news about 1607, and Jamestown that before their Mayflower sailed, Virginia was here, with a house of Burgesses standing for Freeman's rights just as we're standing today. Hurrah for Jamestown and Woodrow Wilson. The enthusiasm excited by the president's message and the volunteers extended to the smallest small boys. For weeks they had been carrying on a war play on their way home from school. Now the game was blocked. The boys who had compassed the Kaiser's forces refused to be Germans. They were Americans. At last, after a whispered consultation with Jeff Spencer, Joe Epps said with a grin, Oh, wait a minute. I'll be the Germans one more time. I'll be them all Kaiser and generals and army. He ran home and soon came back, wearing a German helmet made of an old derby hat, with a tin oil can fastened on top of it. He did the goose step backward down the hill, shouting on, 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 straight to Paris, at tinkling water. He swaggered on the foot log and tumbled, with a mighty splash, into the water, to the huge delight of the other children, who loudly applauded the ignominious end of the German forces.